Hi and welcome to this series of screencasts within the course Mass Transfer in Environmental Engineering. My name is Matthias Salvetig and I work at the Department of Chemical Engineering at Lund University. This screencast is about continuous distillation and phase equilibria and is part of one of three themes in this course, separation processes. The other two themes before Christmas is transport processes and simultaneous mass balance and energy balance. In the latter we will study the air-water system. We will build heavily upon things you learned in previous courses, including the, what you already learned in the first part of this course. So a good idea is to glance through the chapter on heat transfer to freshen up things like heat capacity, evaporation, enthalpy and so on. After Christmas we will go into more detail about heat transfer. To link back to the first part of the course, we will begin by doing a degree of freedom analysis for the distillation setup. In the distillation setup we separate a feed into a distillate and the bottom product flow. Note here that the convention is to use different letters for different flows, so F denotes the molar flow rate in the feed, D the molar flow rate in the distillate and W the molar flow rate in the bottom product. We will only use binary systems in this course and typically we will be given three molar fractions. So the molar fraction of A in the feed, which we will call ZF, the molar fraction of A in the distillate, which we will call XT, and the molar fraction of A in the bottom product, which we will call XW. We will use X to denote the liquid fraction, so the molar fraction in the liquid, and Z we have in the feed because the feed can be gas, it can be liquid, or it can be a mixture of both gas and liquid. You can stop here and try to do a degree of freedom analysis yourself. Okay, let's continue. In the degree of freedom analysis, we have stream variables, we have component balances, we have compositions given, we can introduce a basis of calculation, and we can calculate the degrees of freedom. So in our system we have three flows and two substances in each flow, so that means 3 times 2 equals 6 stream variables. We have two components, substance A and substance B, and only one system, so we can have two component balances. We have three molar fractions given and they are all independent, so we have minus 3 there. And we introduce one basis calculation and we get 0 degrees of freedom and this system is solvable. So let's look at a system in more detail. A distillation setup typically consists of a distillation column equipped with a condenser and a splitter at the top and a reboiler at the bottom. Try to do a degree of freedom analysis for this detailed system, remembering that you have two substances in each flow. Okay, let's continue. We have stream variables, component balances, splitter condition, compositions and basis of calculation and we can calculate the degrees of freedom. Now stream variables, we have two components in each flow and we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 different flows. So that means that we have 8 times 2 equals 16 stream variables. We have two components and we have four subsystems which means that we have minus 8 and we have one splitter condition, we have three compositions given just as before and we introduce one basis calculation and get three degrees of freedom. So what is this freedom all about if you're interested in distillation column design? Well we haven't said anything about energy use, not anything about in the design of the column, how efficient is it? Later we will introduce equilibrium stages to describe the efficiency of the system. We haven't said anything about relative volatility, how easy is it to separate substance A from substance B. And we haven't given any operating conditions. And operating conditions can be given as reflux ratio, boil up ratio and feed conditions. Feed conditions include is it gas, is it liquid, at what temperature is the feed. So to do distillation column design we need to first describe process at the phase boundary. That is we need to find the relation between molar composition of the liquid phase and the molar composition of the gas phase. 
And secondly, we need to make mass balances and energy balances for different segments. And we start by looking at the phase boundary. At the phase boundary we have this continuity, and that is the reason why distillation works. So simply, the concentration in one phase differs from the concentration in the other phase. In this course we will assume equilibrium at the boundary, we will assume no mass transfer limitation, and we will assume that we only have a binary system, that's only two components. If we have no mass transfer limitation, the concentration is constant within the phase, so the concentration only changes when we go from one phase to the other. If we have mass transfer limitation on the other hand, the concentration changes gradually as we approach the phase boundary. And we will talk more about that in coming lectures. If we have phase equilibrium, we can use Big's phase rule, which states that the number of phases plus the number of degrees of freedom equals the number of components plus two. So let's try to calculate the degrees of freedom for two systems. Uh, the first example is a boiling liquid, uh, which is in equilibrium with the condensing gas, and we have pure substance, so the number of components is 1. So please calculate the number of degrees of freedom now. Okay, I hope you have gotten 1 as your answer. 1 degree of freedom means that if we, for example, know the total pressure, then we also know the boiling point. So the boiling point is determined by the pressure. Try now to do the same for a binary mixture where we have two components. Okay, I hope you have gotten two as your answer, which means that if you have the total pressure given and the molar composition, then you can calculate the boiling point. But what is the boiling point? Well, boiling point is related to vapor pressure. And what is vapor pressure? Well, if you have a substance, a pure substance, and at a certain temperature, at equilibrium, the gas above this liquid will have a certain partial pressure of this substance. And that is the vapor pressure of that substance at that temperature. The boiling point, that is the temperature at which the vapor pressure equals the total pressure. So you have different boiling points for different substances, as you already know. The vapor pressure can typically be described uh, using Antoine's equation. So the vapor pressure over pure substance, which we denote Pa0, equals A minus B divided by T plus C. And then you look up A, B and C in a handbook somewhere, noting what kind of unit you should put for T. Sometimes it's actually Celsius. If we have ideal liquid mixtures, we can use Rolle's law to calculate the partial pressure over the surface, simply by taking the molar fraction of A times the vapor pressure over pure substance. The convention in distillation is to use A for the most volatile component and B for the less volatile component. And since we only have binary systems in this course, it's very easy to calculate the molar fraction of B. For ideal gases, and we will assume that we have ideal gases in this course, we can use Dalton's law, which states that the partial pressure of A equals the total pressure times the molar fraction of A in the gas phase. So now you know everything to be able to calculate how the partial pressure varies with molar fractions for ideal mixtures. And I recommend you that you do this by yourself or together with some friend, this exercise and it's described in more detail in another screencast. You can also use Dalton's law and Rolle's law to create XY diagrams. An XY diagram is a diagram which shows you the relation between the composition of a boiling liquid and the composition of a condensing gas. If you have a non-ideal mixture, you have to use the activity coefficient. So we get this equation instead that the partial pressure of A equals the activity coefficient of A times the vapor pressure over pure substance times the molar fraction of A in the liquid. And the activity coefficient is dependent of the composition. 
there is a thermodynamic relation between different activity coefficients of a mixture. And in the binary system, this means that these activity coefficients are either both larger than one or both smaller than one. And the result is that we have Henry's law, which means that at, for diluted solutions, we can write that the partial pressure of A equals Henry's constant for that substance times the composition of A. So at diluted solutions, we have a linear relation. And at a concentrated solution, we also have a linear relation, basically Rawls' law. And in between, it's more difficult to describe. And there we have to use the activity coefficients. OK, so we have described the process at the phase boundary. And now it's time to make a mass balance and energy balance for different segments. To do that, we have to simplify. And we introduce a new concept, equilibrium stage, which we also know as theoretical plate. An equilibrium stage is a segment of the distillation column where the inflows and outflows are in equilibrium with each other. And there are more explanations in a separate podcast. OK, so you have a setup. This is the setup you will be using in the lab with a certain number of trays. And you convert that into a mathematical model with a number of equilibrium stages. How many depends on how efficient the trays are. We'll come back to that soon. OK, so here we have drawn one, two, three different equilibrium stages. The total condenser doesn't add anything to the separation, although it's very important for the distillation column as such. But the reboiler is an equilibrium stage. Note here, and this is very important, the number of physical trays are always larger than the number of equilibrium stages. And we can write the overall tray efficiency as the ratio between these two. So equilibrium stages in the column divided by the physical trace in the column. And of course, the efficiency is always less than 100%. And when we calculate the overall tray efficiency, note that we take the equilibrium stages within the column divided by the physical trace within the column. So only these two here, because the reboiler is outside the column. So we divide the system into a certain number of equilibrium stages and we make mass balances. But do we need an energy balance? Well, not if we have no heat loss and if the evaporation enthalpy is independent of the composition. So let's divide the system into three different parts. The upper part, the feed part and the lower part. So first write the mass balance of the upper part. You can do this by yourself and pause here. OK, let's continue. We have one inflow and two outflows. And since we will assume here steady state and we have no reaction, we simply get in equals out and we get that V times Y equals L times X plus D times XD. And we can rewrite that as Y equals L divided by V times X plus D divided by V times XD. And the indexes here denote at what stage this flow emanates from. So where does this flow come from? We can rewrite this using the reflux ratio, which is defined as L0 divided by D. L0 is the liquid flux that's coming back from the condenser into the distillation column. And we get this equation here. Y equals R divided by R plus 1 X plus 1 divided by R plus 1 X D. OK, let's write the mass balance for the lower part. You can do that yourself. Pause here. So we have once again one inflow and we have two outflows. And we simply write else times X equals V times Y plus W times XW. And we use an overline over, over L and V to denote that we're now dealing with the lower part of the distillation column. And we can rewrite that into y equals L divided by V times X minus W divided by V times XW. And V divided by W is the boil up ratio, 
which we mentioned earlier as a, an operating condition. We can step through the distillation column. So for each equilibrium stage we use both the mass balance and the equilibrium at the phase boundary. The equilibrium is given by the system curve and we can simply step through. But as you might see here, these points seem to be lying on a line, a straight line for the upper part and a straight line for the lower part. So is the mass balance a straight line? Yes, it is. If the evaporation enthalpy is independent of composition, that is that the evaporation enthalpy of substance A in molar terms must equal the evaporation enthalpy of substance B. And there has to be no mixing enthalpy. You can see if there is a mixing enthalpy if you mix substance A and substance B with the same temperature. And if you mix them if the, and the temperature changes, then there is a mixing enthalpy. There also must be no heat loss or the heat loss must be negligible. If this is true, then what will happen at each equilibrium stage is that if a certain number of mole condenses, the same number of mole will actually evaporate. And that means that the flows will be constant in the upper part and in the lower part. We call the upper part of the distillation column, so the, the part above the feed, the rectifying section, and the part below the feed, the stripper section. And if this is true, we can use mccabe tillis graphical method. If not, we need to make energy balance for each equilibrium stage. In mccabe tillis graphical method, we first draw the diagonal as a helpline, then we draw the upper mass balance or, or the upper operating line. We draw something that is called the Q line, then we draw the lower operating line, and finally we draw steps where each triangle here represents an equilibrium stage. So what about the Q line? Well, we haven't talked anything about the third part, the feed part. And if you make a mass balance of that, it's easiest to do it if you think of the feed as consisting of a liquid part and a vapor part, and where Q equals the liquid fraction. So you get the liquid fraction equals Q times F and the vapor fraction equals 1 minus Q times F, where Q can be calculated as the energy needed to evaporate one mole of the feed divided by the enthalpy of evaporation for the feed at the boiling point. And you can then derive uh, the Q line as Y equals Q divided by Q minus 1 times X minus ZF divided by Q minus 1. And we call this the Q line. So what does the Q line look like? Well, it will have a certain slope depending on what kind of conditions you have in the feed. If it's overheated vapor, saturated vapor, liquid plus vapor, saturated liquid, or liquid below boiling point. Try to figure out which is which here. Is one overheated vapor or is it liquid below boiling point? Well, it's liquid below boiling point. And then we have saturated liquid, a vertical line. You can remember that by thinking that on a vertical line, all points have the same liquid composition, right? So that has something to do with a saturated liquid. We have liquid plus gas and then we have a horizontal line which is saturated gas. You can once again remember that as each point on the horizontal line has the same gas composition and number five is the overheated vapor or superheated gas which we also can call it. So please remember once again that the number of physical trays are always larger than the number of equilibrium stages. And if you're asked to how many physical trays are needed, you have to answer with an integer. So if you get 13.2, you have to round that up to 14, because 13 is not enough. If you're asked to calculate the number of equilibrium stages, you're supposed to give that as a decimal in this course, for example 5.0 or 7.1. When you calculate the number of physical trays, you're typically given an overall tray efficiency. But remember that you then have to compare with how many equilibrium stages you need within the column. And if you have a reboiler, that is one equilibrium stage outside the column. And if you have a partial condenser, 
that's also one equilibrium stage outside the column. What we haven't said anything about so far is the feed location. The feed location is the triangle in the diagram that has one corner on each operating line. And the optimal feed location is the where you change from upper to lower operating line as soon as you've passed an intersection of the two lines. This way you get the minimum number of triangles in your drawing. So now we're ready actually to do our first exercise. And there is a separate uh, screencast on the web page for that, where we will solve one exam question taken straight out of exam from 2009.